I want to invite everyone to turn to Exodus 5. Exodus chapter 5. And uh, our starting set of verses will be verses 1 through 9, and then later we'll look at verses 20 through 23. I'm going to begin by sharing some words from the Apostle Paul out of Philippians chapter 3, verse 12. And Paul says this He says, Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on, that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. Here is the thing. God's going to speak to us. God's going to lay a calling on our heart to do something maybe out in the world, like a mission trip, or maybe right here in the church, like teach Sunday school. But God's going to lay some kind of calling on our heart. Last week, we looked at how some of us refuse to accept responsibility for that. But here, let's continue on. Once you do accept responsibility to accept God's invitation in God's timing, the chains of bondage are going to come upon your life and begin to, to tighten their hold. The devil doesn't like it when we get serious about serving God. So he mounts an attack. He mounts an offensive against you. Now, Jesus told us something about the end times that I think can actually be applied to our lives right now, to our, to our struggle with Satan. He said in Revelation 2.10, Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested. And I think that happens to us on a daily basis. We are tested by the devil. All you have to do is go back to, to Job, and you can see that this is true. And the devil's about to throw some of us into prison. Equate that to bondage. We come under spiritual bondage, a spiritual prison. But Jesus said, be faithful. Be faithful until death. And that is our calling. To be faithful to the Lord no matter what He's told us to do until death. To never give up. To never turn back. Be faithful unto death. And He says, I will give you the crown of life. Now, when God calls you out of your comfort zone, the bondage that you're planning on escaping, here's the thing, it often grows heavier as you're trying to break free. It grows heavier. Why? To hold you back, to keep you from advancing. We're supposed to be faithful until death. We're supposed to keep pressing ahead and never give up. Now, let me give you some examples from the lives of Jesus and Paul. For example, when Jesus began his ministry. At the very start of his ministry, equate that to us, you know, stepping out in faith into what God's called us to do. That's when we began. Well, when Jesus began his ministry, what happened to him? He was immediately led into the wilderness to be what? Tested or tempted by the devil. But you know what? Jesus refused to succumb to the enemy. And what he did is he became Uh, an overcomer by keeping his focus on what? The Word of God. So he pressed on. He overcame, even though he was tempted by the devil. And look at the life of the Apostle Paul. Paul stated of his ministry that he never lost heart amid his afflictions. Why? In 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 17, he said he never lost heart because he realized his afflictions lasted only for a brief moment. How many of y'all realize this life is fleeting? Amen? This life is brief. It's going to be gone in the blink of an eye. You see, Paul was able to acquire victory by keeping a proper perspective on the brevity of his burdens. And he remained focused on something far greater. And here's what he said. We do not look at the things which are seen but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, right? So Paul looked past his momentary problems to what could be seen through the eyes of faith by viewing the things which are eternal. So both Jesus and Paul were tested as they got serious about God. Satan had hoped to turn both of them back from their mission But they pressed through their bondage by looking beyond to focus on something greater. Now for Jesus, the Word of God 
It was greater than Satan's temptations. And for Paul, the hope of an eternal reward after a job well done was greater than the devil's afflictions. And as you'll soon discover, a major key to pursuing God's best is to keep pressing straight ahead through any hardship. Pressing through bondage, no matter how difficult it becomes. How? By keeping your spiritual eyes fixed on the mission to which you have been called. Now the Bible reveals how burdens will begin to increase when God is getting ready to do a great work among his people. And I want to show you that. Let's look at verses 1 through 8. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, thus says the Lord God of Israel, let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, nor will I let Israel go. So they said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go three days journey into the desert and sacrifice to the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with a sword. And the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people from their work? Get back to your labor. And Pharaoh said, look, the people of the land are many now and you make them rest from their labor. So the same day, Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and their officers saying, you shall no longer give the people straw to make brick as before. Let them go and gather straw for themselves and you shall lay on them the quota of bricks which they made before. You shall not reduce it. So we know that Moses accepted God's invitation. And we see here that he arrived with his brother Aaron in Pharaoh's throne room. And they stood together in delivering the bold message for the king of Egypt to let God's people go. And this word was immediately met with resistance. Once you realize God's calling in your life, and once you decide to embrace it, once you come to the place where you're ready to announce it to friends, family, loved ones, You need to get ready for resistance. It will happen. It may have been difficult for you to accept God's calling. You struggled with it for a very long time. But it can be equally hard for those closest to you as they struggle to understand. See, you personally had to come to a place where you were willing to leave the comfort of familiar surroundings. But keep in mind that friends and loved ones are sometimes stuck in that exact same place. See, many of them are still held in bondage, if you will. Living at ease. Living at ease in self-created walls of security. And just as the news of God's invitation rocked your world, you can be sure it's going to rock theirs too. Not everyone's going to welcome the news of God's big plan. And when you open yourself to the Lord's will, others are automatically convicted of their own need to get right with God. And because they're settled where they are, they can become extremely uncomfortable with your faith-filled decision. And instead of rejoicing with you, they will often try to discourage you from following the Lord. And should they succeed, it's going to set their own mind at ease. And knowing that They're not alone in their complacent lifestyle. And though few will admit it, their reasoning goes like this. If everybody else is doing it, hey, it must be okay with me. Mediocrity is fine. While Moses and Aaron confronted Pharaoh, we read here in the scripture, the Hebrews, they took a short break. They rested from their labors and burdens. And at this moment, the people began to experience a taste, a foreshadow, of the good things to come. But as soon as they begin entering into alignment with God's plan for rest, the people's burdens were increased. And to apply this, just as soon as you make a decision to break away from your comfort zone, your burdens will begin increasing too. And this is an occurrence that rarely fails. Now, when burdens arise, they may come in the form of criticism and ridicule, which can bring you down. It's going to bring you down mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Thomas Carlyle has accurately stated, ridicule is the language 
of the devil. Amen. Now, burdens can also arise in the form of outward tests, such as physical trials, maybe even monetary trials. You might see a series of unfortunate events take place in your life, trying to knock you down. And they're so close together that you can barely get back to your knees before you receive another blow. Multiple medical needs may arise, or maybe everything in your possession, like your car, your home, all of a sudden breaks down, falls apart, needs costly maintenance. What we need to understand is burdens. These burdens are not a coincidence. They arise in correlation to God's work in your life. And you can't blame them on God. It's not God doing it. These increase the burdens. They're Satan's attempt to persuade you to turn back, to declare it's too hard. And the the thing is, the devil's trying to thwart God's kingdom purposes. Now, one aspect of the escalation of burdens is a growing presence of critics and scoffers. You see, what other people speak into your life can either bring incredible release for you to flourish or bring an incredible hold that will leave you in bondage. Now, Moses and Aaron, right after they demanded the release of God's people, they experienced ridicule. Ridicule came from Pharaoh here. I want you to look at 8b through 9. And we read here, for they, this is Pharaoh speaking, for they are idle. Therefore, they cry out saying, let us go and sacrifice to our God. Let more work be laid on the men that they may labor in it and let them not regard false words. Pharaoh ridiculed the Israelites. He called them idle. He called them lazy. Their desire to worship God was mocked and misinterpreted as an excuse to get out of working. You see, so many times the call to follow the Lord is viewed as being An easy way out for those who can't cope with real life pressures. You know, there are some people who believe that those in ministry don't understand the value of hard work. They think ministers are lazy and that's one of the forms of ridicule that will be cast out. Should the call to follow God in obedience require you to abandon your occupation? There's a good chance that you're going to be mocked and you're going to be called lazy, that people are going to say you're living in some virtual reality. But here's the thing, if the Lord requires you to abandon everything, you can't deny Him based on what other people think, can you? The only perception you need to be concerned about is God's. How He views you, how He sees you, how He feels about you. Now the Israelites, their calling was said to be false words. We see that the Pharaoh said, don't regard false words. Their calling was said to be false words. Not real. Not from God. Here's something else. Whenever you decide to announce the news of God's work and His invitation in your life, people will sometimes say, it's not true. They'll say, you've not heard from God. Some people may even say, you're absolutely crazy. The Christian music group, Mercy Me, they sang a song about calling. I want to share a few lyrics of their song. They said, I've not been called to the wisdom of this world, but to a God who is calling out to me. And even though the world may think that I'm losing touch with reality, it would be crazy to choose this world over eternity. Amen. You're ever going to press into God's best. It's important to remain focused on the one who's calling you and on the destination to where he's calling. Now, in response to the opinions of other people, the Apostle Peter once stated this. This is 2 Peter 2.19. He said, for by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. If you take the ridicule from other people to heart, you can easily allow that individual to place you in bondage. You can easily become trapped in bondage by the opinion of other people. You can't allow mockery and derision to divert you from your true course or you could remain as a slave in Egypt. 
The increase of burdens and ridicule from others can leave you hanging in doubt. And this is the state of mind in which Moses, Aaron, and the Israelites found themselves. Look at verses 20 through 23. Skip on down. Then, as they came out from Pharaoh, they met Moses and Aaron who stood there to meet them. And they said to them, let the Lord look on you and judge because you have made us abhorrent in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants to put a sword in their hand to kill us. So Moses returned to the Lord and said, Lord, why have you brought trouble on this people? Why is it that you have sent me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people. Neither have you delivered your people at all. So do you see what's going on here? We first of all see that the increase of burdens was imposed on the Israelites alone. Just them, not on Moses and Aaron. But you know, Moses, Aaron, and the Israelites, they were all in the struggle for freedom together. Not one of them was unaffected by ridicule and doubt. The moment any believer takes a first step in pursuing God's best, his or her burdens will begin to increase. And when this occurs, questioning arises. That's when you start questioning. First, you'll begin to question yourself as to whether you really heard from God. And secondly, other people are, are going to question you like they did Moses. And when things don't go smoothly, and when questions begin to arise from all sides, then you can begin to doubt your calling. James said this. He said, he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. You see, doubt leaves you in a state of indecision. It leaves you in a state where you're tossed back and forth among different options, wondering which one is the correct choice, wondering which direction is the, the right way to proceed. And when you can't decide on what to do, you might refuse to do anything at all. William Shakespeare said this. He said, our doubts make us lose the good we oft might win by fearing to attempt. Doubt can stop you in your tracks. Doubt can make you settle back down in bondage and refuse to press on. The first thing that the people question is whether they had heard correctly. Whether they had heard correctly about the Lord coming to deliver them. And so they doubted themselves. They doubted their ability to actually hear from God. They then went from doubting them, themselves to doubting the Lord. Now Moses, acting as an Israelite spokesman, brought their doubts directly to God. And he even expressed his own numerous concerns. And here's the thing. Whenever you doubt the Lord, you may ask things like, Why did this happen, Lord? Why, God? Why am I having so much trouble? Why did you allow this to take place? But I want to caution you to hold off from blaming God. And first consider that the increase of burdens might be opposition from your enemy, the devil. Keep in mind that hardship is not necessarily a sign that you're on the wrong path. It could be a sign of just the opposite. That you're right in the center where God wants you to be. And perhaps the devil, through means of doubt, is trying to distract you from your true course. Should you experience any of these burdens, they're going to be placed on you during your time of decision. And the reason why is Satan wants to frighten you into remaining where you are. He wants you to be stuck in spiritual bondage. He wants you to be like a helpless marionette, subservient to the devil's every whim. If you're ever going to escape and move past mediocrity, you must overcome. You must keep pressing ahead. John encouraged his readers in 1 John 2.14. He said this, I want you to get this. He says, you are strong. If you know Jesus, listen to this. You are strong, he says. And the word of God abides in you. And you have overcome the wicked one. You have overcome. It is possible to overcome the wicked one. And to do so, you must keep a proper perspective on your situation. Robert Schuller said, press on. Obstacles are seldom the same size tomorrow as they are today. 
The key is to realize that the obstacles that you face are spiritual attacks. That's what they are. They're designed with the purpose of holding you back. And you must be determined to overcome and break through to victory. Now you press on by keeping your eyes on the prize. That might be something a coach would say to you. You got to keep your eyes on the prize. Isn't that right? God's invitation and your vision about that invitation or your vision about the completion of His plan in your life, that must become the goal for which you aim and attain. And during the entire journey, you must keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, who is the one who orchestrates His master plan. The Apostle Paul said, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. The writer of Hebrews said, Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. If you're ever going to get through the bondage, you've got to press ahead, no matter what people may say, no matter what people may think. John stated that you're able to overcome. You, sitting in the pew today, you are able to overcome with the help of the Savior, Jesus Christ. The reason why, 1 John 4, 4, greater is He that is in you, than he that is in the world. Amen. Once you accept God's invitation, burdens will begin to increase to discourage you from continuing on. So I want to ask you, how are you going to respond when this happens? Keep in mind that the key to victory is pressing on with endurance, diligence, persistence, perseverance. So instead of focusing on ridicule and doubt, you need to ignore the burdens and trials that arise on every side. I want to share one last example. When a horseman, horse rider, goes out riding alongside a highway, he places blinders on that horse to help it remain focused ahead, to keep it from being distracted by any movement on the side, especially those passing cars that are going by. In this manner, the horse will be kept safe from making any sudden decision to bolt or turn into traffic. In a similar fashion, you must place blinders on your spiritual peripheral vision. And you must look straight ahead to the goal and calling. And this is the only way to refrain from making any perilous moves. And you must look ultimately unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith, and then you'll be able to press ahead through the bondage. In life, we are often faced with many decisions, amen? We're often faced with many decisions. Decisions concerning which path, which road we're going to take through life. We're faced with a decision to settle down or move ahead or to go left or to go right. You know, the same thing happens spiritually. It's important that we choose the correct path. In Matthew 7, 13 through 14, Jesus said, Enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. If we wish to make it to heaven one day, we must choose the narrow gate. We must choose the narrow path. In John 10, 9, we learn what this is. Jesus said, I am the door. So He's the gate. He's the narrow path. He says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The only way to be forgiven of your sins, the only way to receive eternal life, to be saved, is to enter into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ by confessing Him as your Lord and Savior. Romans 10, 9-10 says, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes 
unto righteousness, and with a mouth confession is made unto salvation. You see, the true prize in life, it's not some calling, is it? It's not some mission trip. It's not being a preacher. It's not getting up and singing and everybody clapping for you. That's not the true prize in life, is it? It's not the true calling. The true calling, the true prize is Jesus. He's the goal that we need to be aiming for. Remember Hebrews 12, 1 through 2? We read, Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith.